This April 25th meeting of the Senate Finance Committee will come to order. We have two bills. We hope to see how far we can get today if we have a chance before session. Um, we're starting with Senator Dibble's omnibus transportation bill. Welcome to the Senate Finance Committee. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you for the opportunity to present the Senate, uh, Senate file 3157. Although I know the House file has made its way over, I don't know if we're dealing with House file number now. I don't even know what it is. But uh, in any case, this is the Senate uh, Omnibus uh, Transportation Finance Bill. Um, and Mr. Chair, in the interest of time, I'll just give some very brief uh, framing remarks uh, to communicate some context in which this proposal comes forward. And then with uh, your indulgence or agreement, um, I'll rely on uh, Senate Council and Research um, to do some high-level walkthrough of the elements, and then we can get on to amendments and conversation, if that works for you. So um, the legislature, Mr. Chair, has not meaningfully invested in Minnesota's roads for 30 years. And of course, we know it shows up in their poor condition, as anyone who uses them knows well, particularly the weaknesses in our roadway system and the lack of infrastructure that was made readily apparent by the extreme variations in temperature we had this winter, which allowed, of course, for a uh, freeze-thaw cycle um, to really exploit the opportunity for a bumper crop of potholes, uh, both on the roadway system owned and operated by the state of Minnesota, as well as the majority of the mileage, which is 80% or more, that's owned and operated by our local units of government. Our transit system is on the verge of collapse. And I'm not being hyperbolic there. Uh, we have not put any general fund dollars in any sustained way into our transit system, particularly our local bus system, for a number of years, zero dollars in general fund. We are facing major rider safety issues, serious problems, of course, with ongoing mega major projects. State transportation funding has long been dwindling, defined primarily by the decrease in the resources we received from the gas tax, which is a tiny fraction of what it was originally worth relative to inflation. The decreases coming from, of course, the impacts of inflation, the effects of, uh, of, of increased fuel efficiency and the like. Um, but Mr. Chair, uh, if you take a look at the chart um, that I think was just handed out, you can see that despite the occasional one-off transportation bills that we pass and uh, the uh, modest uh, bill that we passed in 2007, the funds that we put into our road system, road and bridge system, have been in decline. And of course, transportation, particularly transit in the metro area, uh, is in a severe case of crisis. So, Mr. Chair, um, I'll just speed this up a little bit. The bill represents uh, an opportunity to reverse this trend, maybe even a historic opportunity to invest in this critical system that connects Minnesotans to each other, to work, to health care, to school, to everything else. Um, that they need. Mr. Chair, uh, transportation investments bring us a return on the dollars. All economic studies show that every dollar we put into transportation returns $3. Transit's return on investment is even greater, returning up to $5 for every dollar we put in. But Mr. Chair, we also pay if we don't invest. And the way we pay shows up in many ways. In the effect on our climate, in lack of individual prosperity, the lack of growth in our economy, a transportation system that only becomes more and more expensive to keep up, uh, and, uh, and on it goes, forcing more people to own a vehicle who could otherwise make use of transit represents a $10,000 premium on that family's life. So, uh, Mr. Chair, this uh, bill um, relies on uh, a number of the very traditional workhorses of our Highway User Tax Distribution Fund and support for local units of government, um, as well as a very traditional source to support transit in the metropolitan area, namely the 
the license tab fees, also known as the motor vehicle registration tax, um, uh, the motor vehicle sales tax, and the newest kid on the block, um, the auto parts sales tax, which of course is not a dedicated source for transportation, although statutorily we would move it in that direction. Um, and so, Mr. Chair, um, the opportunity we have, of course, to match IIJA funding is enormous. Uh, the opportunity to support our local units of government on a sustained, ongoing basis is an exciting aspect of this bill, and I'm particularly proud of that as well. Those 80% sort, those of the miles, every tra trip that begins and ends on the local road is supported almost solely by property tax, uh, which is the most regressive form of tax, and we're not keeping up with that. Um, so, Mr. Chair, with that, um, that's my opening, those are my opening comments and the context, and we can get into the details uh, with uh, Ms. Boyd and Mr. Greenfield. Maybe we should um, entertain a couple of technical amendments sure. that are important before we do the spreadsheet walkthrough, because the spreadsheet and the language walkthrough are keyed off of these sure. two uh, amendments, the A51 and the A54. A51, are they... Okay, they both have to be says, both. Yeah, hand them both. They're not in the packets, members, so they are being distributed both. Which one's going first? A51. A51 is being distributed first, so we'll take that up as soon as people get it. And of course, this is. Wouldn't be a, an author's amendment. This is not the Committee of Original Jurisdiction. So, if Mr. Chair, if you'd like a walkthrough, Ms. Boyd is ready to do a quick overview of the A51 if so desired. Sure. Who wants to deal oh, with sorry, the, the uh, I'm sorry, the A51 is, a, is more keyed on language, so that would be Mr. Yeah. Greenfield. Okay. Yeah. We'll Thank start with A51, which I think all members should have by now. Um, and go ahead, Mr. Greenfield. Yep. Mr. Chair, thank you, um, and members of the committee. The A51 uh, is almost exclusively language that was heard by the Judiciary Committee on April 12th to th um, of this year. Um, there were three transportation bills that were heard by Judiciary after third deadline that Judiciary then made those changes. So we are then incorporating those changes into um, the the more policy-oriented aspects of the 3157. So there's nothing in here that hasn't already been vetted in terms of a page and line instruction by the Judiciary Committee. Um, the first instruction um, on page one is a um, auditing a retroactive appeal related to Article 4. The second instruction on page one is the effective date change. The Second, the third instruction on page one is an amendment to the transit safety bill in Article Six. Um, the Judiciary Committee had some slight changes and reorganizations of the um, transit safety bill, Senate File 1049, uh, and then the final set of instructions on page two, 168, line 27, and 168, delete lines 28 and 29. These are changes to Senate File 3187, the rail safety bill. Um, there was a question about uh, data classification for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. This was Senator Kupek's bill. So um, these three sets of bills were amended on April 12th by Judiciary Committee, and we're just picking up those changes here. Finally, the last instruction on page two, line 14, is just a minor technical clarification for a working group that was um, that is just a cleanup from our markup in the Transportation Committee. That's the only thing that was not vetted by the Judiciary Committee. Everything else is just conformance. Senator Friends moves the A51 technical amendment. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. A54. That's been distributed as well, I believe, to all members. Uh, Mr. Greenfield, are you going to explain that one as well? Or? I'll let Ms. Boyd handle the A54. Boyd, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, the A54 um, is mostly technical, um, but it does move some money around to encompass some late-breaking uh, fiscal note estimates uh, and revenue estimates, um, and also some effects on the Trunk Highway Fund. So there's some uh, reductions in here so that the fund is not overspent in the forecast period. Um, 
I'll give you a very brief walkthrough. I will skip those parts that are just technical drafting changes. Um, lines 118 and 119 are changes to the Safe Routes to School appropriations from the general fund. Um, on line 118, that includes a carry forward of unexpended money from the last budget period. <clears throat> On lines 123 to 2.3, this is changes to uh, the freight division under MnDOT. This includes an increase on line 1.25 to the appropriation for the Stone Arch Bridge uh, reconstruction. And then there's some carry forward amounts for um, starting on 127 for a freight network optimization tool that was appropriated in the last budget and some amount of that is being carried forward. Uh, lines 24 to 26 are changes to state road construction appropriations um, to account for um, uh, reduced availability of funds in the trunk highway fund. And likewise, lines 27 to 210 are changes to corridors of commerce appropriations. Um, these are all trunk highway fund appropriations under MnDOT. Lines 211 to 214 are changes to highway debt service. There were some changes to the trunk highway bonds made in the last uh, round, uh, less committee round of this bill, and there are new debt service estimates related to that. Lines 215 to 221 is the new inclusion of a gov, uh, governor recommendation for tower replacement for two towers under the armor system. Uh, this is $2 million uh, additional from the general fund. And you can see that language 218 to 221 on the amendment. Lines 222 and 220 to 223. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Uh, our changes to appropriations for county state aid highways. Um, this is related to reduced availability of funds in the highway user tax distribution fund that flows through to these state aid uh, funds. So uh, the appropriation also needed to be reduced. And likewise on 225 and 226, that's the municipal state aid appropriation reduction related to that change. Uh, lines 227 through 3.12 are changes related to um, a new fiscal note on staffing requirements for the new um, electric vehicle infrastructure program under MnDOT. Uh, the, that staffing number was reduced and that change is included in the rider language on 3.2 to 3.11. Uh, page, let's see. Uh, lines 313 to 314 is affixed to the 26 and 27 appropriation for Metro Mobility under Met Council. Uh, lines 323 to 43 are cancellation amounts to match identical carry forward amounts for safe routes to school, uh, freight, and um, an appropriation for employment and economic development that's in our bill. Lines 44 to 429 cancel unexpended driver services appropriations to a new DVS account that we'll talk about in a bit. And likewise, on 430 to 531, this cancels unexpended vehicle services appropriations to the new DVS account. Lines 532 to 66 is a carry forward of a deed appropriation for staffing related to a MnDOT freight uh, provision. And we'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, lines, let's see. Lines 616 to 617 are changes to the 26 and 27 appropriations uh, for active transportation uh, supported by transfers from the general fund. <laughs> And then lines 618 to 626 transfers the remaining balances of existing DVS operating accounts to the new combined account created in the bill at the end of the fiscal year. Discussion on the A54 amendment. Senator Friends moves A54 technical amendment. Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And that was kind of quick, so I picked up a couple of quick notes. I'd like to ask a couple of questions. Um, Ms. Boyd mentioned um, carryover from the previous fiscal year, unexpended uh, funds that were carrying, were carrying over from the previous fiscal year. I was wondering if Mr. Nauman could give me a sense of how that impacts forecast and targets because my, my supposition is that those were not in the original forecast. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt, it's a really good question. There is a budget, <clears throat> excuse me, a budgetary process that um, the legislature often employs when it wishes to extend a carry forward from one biennium into the next, and that's what's happening in these instances. If that happens under our budget tracking rules and the, the appropriation value that was previously established is simply carried forward from one biennium into the next, it creates a scorable cost. By contrast, if the dollars are canceled and then reappropriated in the next biennium, 
we can make that a no cost item. So that's the mechanism that's being employed here in the amendment. Senator Dibble on that. Yeah. And just uh, specifically, Mr. Chair, that item um, was a Minnesota Chamber of Commerce priority around developing what's called a freight optimization tool, which uh, if I think about it for five minutes, I'll remember exactly what that is, but something very important for managing our freight um, movements in, in the, in the uh, state, um, and it's a joint project between DEED and the Department of Transportation, which we carried in the transportation bill last year, and they just simply haven't finished the, all of the programming and setup of that initiative, and so are still working on it. Senator Pratt. Oh, that's it. Further discussion of the A54 amendment. If not, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Senator Dibble, do you want to do more amendments right now or do you want to go do the walkthrough now? Um, Mr. Chair, um, I could go either way. So we have uh, uh, eight, uh, eight amendments here on my list. So eight additional amendments on my list. Which is easier for people to understand if you do the amendments first or the walkthrough is assuming these amendments or? Or most of it doesn't. Yeah, the walkthrough is not keyed off of any of the remaining amendments. The remaining amendments are um, are kind of adjustments and late breaking ideas and things like that. Okay. Well, maybe you want to go through the walkthrough. Is Ms. Boyd, you going to go first? Spreadsheets. Or? Um, Mr. Chair, I believe so. We okay. can start with the spreadsheet. Um, and I just want to point out, and should have made, maybe made that more clear before I walk through the A54, that the spreadsheet in front of you includes the changes just made in the A54 right. that was adopted. Um, so you can look at the package as a whole. Um, so uh, just to orient you to the spreadsheet, um, the last columns are the Senate position, including the A54 amendment. And I'm going to start actually on the last page of the spreadsheet. Um, to give you a summary of the general fund position for transportation. Um, so if you'll look at line 584 on the spreadsheet, that is base general fund spending for transportation, 271.5 million in 24 and 25, and the same in the 26-27 biennium. And then if you look at line 585, you'll see the change items from general fund base um, the general fund target in the boxes under the spreadsheet for 24 and 25 was 1 billion 75 million from the general fund and in the tails in 26 and 27 130 million. So you'll see that there's no under or over so the target was met with the spending and revenue changes in the bill. So now go back up to the beginning and now I'll walk through the change items uh, for all funds in transportation. Um, there are a number of areas under MnDOT, um, I'll, I'll start with the Department of Transportation. Um, there are a number of areas under MnDOT that are related to the match for the um, IIJA federal infrastructure bill that was passed last year, maybe a year and a half ago now. Um, and these are uh, general fund and trunk highway fund appropriations, so I'll point them out as we get to them. Uh, line 17 is the first one under aeronautics. This is a, a match for uh, formula funds and discretionary funds for aeronautics of 26 million, and this amount is available until the end of fiscal year 2027. That is common for all of the IIJA match funding. Uh, the next on line 19 is an appropriation from the state airports fund for aeronautic systems and investments. This was a governor's recommendation. However, the governor had this appropriation from the general for replacement of automated weather observing systems and instrument landing systems at um, statewide uh, airports. And that's a one-time appropriation. Uh, on line 29, these are, this is another governor's rec to maintain current service levels. There are, I believe this is common in other budget areas as well. Um, there are appropriations sprinkled throughout the agencies and different divisions to account for compensation increases, insurance increases, IT cost increases, and things like that. So uh, these are sprinkled throughout the different areas. So here's the first one on line 29 under aeronautics for aviation support. Um, from the general fund, 57,024, 91,000 ongoing, starting in 25. 
And then on line 31 is another governor's rec to replace two utility aircraft for the department. Uh, these are used to transport MnDOT employees, technicians who work at uh, airports around the state and uh, carry replacement parts and do maintenance and repairs at these airports. This is $7 million for this aircraft replacement, one time from the general fund. Line 43 is another piece of maintaining current service levels, also from the general fund. This is for tran the Office of Transit, 77,024 and 123,025 and ongoing. Um, and line 44 is another piece of the IIJA federal match dollars. This is also from the general fund for transit of 68 million. Also available, uh, it's one time, but available until the end of fiscal year 27. Line 45 um, is a statutory appropriation related to a transfer of money later in the spreadsheet from the general fund to the existing active transportation account. Um, this is, uh, that money is statutorily appropriated to the commissioner. So that's 25 million in each of 24 and 25, uh, and then 2.799 and 26 million, and 2.8 and 27 and ongoing. <clears throat> Next, under Safe Routes to School at MnDOT, there is a $10 million uh, increase um, on line 52, $10 million in each year from the general fund. That money is available until 2027, the end of 2027, and then an ongoing base increase of 845,000 in each year thereafter. Um, in line 53, this is a governor's recommendation to, um, we talked about it a bit earlier, uh, this is a cancellation and carry forward. You can see the cancellation under the fiscal year 23 change items column that's shaded under the Senate provisions. Uh, that's, that's the amount that's estimated to be unexpended and then reappropriated in 2024 uh, for grants that are, are going out the door that have not uh, been completed yet. Uh, under passenger rail on line 60, this is ongoing money for the Twin Cities Milwaukee Chicago Rail Corridor. Uh, a second train was added in the last budget cycle for that corridor, and this is um, some capital improvement money and some federal match money to defray operations costs for several years, and then ongoing operations in 26 and 27. That is from the general fund. So 1.955 and 24, 3.36 million and 25 and then ongoing amounts of 4.9 million starting in 26. Uh, in line 61, there's a one-time appropriation from the general fund for the Northern Lights Express rail uh, corridor. That money is one time, but is available until the end of fiscal year 27. Moving down to line 68 and 69, these are more pieces of maintaining current service levels at the department. Uh, on line 68, that's a general fund piece under freight of 151,000 and 24 and 242,000 in 25 and ongoing. On line 69, this is the piece that is uh, of, of that GovRAC that is funded from the Trunk Highway Fund under freight, 489,000 and 24 and 788,000 and 25 and ongoing. Line 70 is a uh, governor's recommendation to improve a uh, way station program. Um, uh, MnDOT is responsible for building and maintaining the facilities for way stations, and uh, this is a partial funding of the governor's recommendation uh, of 500000 a year from the general fund ongoing. On line 71 is the governor's recommendation uh, for the uh, reconstruction of the Stone Arch Bridge. Uh, this is $2.429 million in fiscal year 24, one time from the general fund, but available until the end of fiscal year 27. On line 72, this is, to f uh, this is an a reduction from base from the general fund uh, for rail safety inspectors. In current law, there are six rail safety inspectors um, under MnDOT's um, Freight and Rail Safety Office. Four of them are funded by special revenue assessments on the railroads. Two are currently funded from the general fund. So those two that are current, currently funded from the general fund, that's the governor's recommendation to shift them into the special revenue um, assessment funding. So that's a reduction in base related to two inspectors. Uh, line 73, we talked about the uh, cancellation and carry forward of money for the freight optimization tool. Um, that's a cancellation of 974000 from the general fund and a reappropriation of that amount that was unexpended from the last budget cycle. Lines 74 and 75 is related to the rail safety pieces uh, we'll touch on later in the bill. 74, uh, line 74 is a tran it reflects a transfer from um, 
the railroad and pipeline safety account in the special revenue fund that's funded by assessments on railroads and pipeline companies in the bill. These amounts on line 74 are transferred to the rail grade crossing safety account and available to MnDOT for uh, infrastructure improvements at rail grade crossings. Lines, and that's 750,024 and 1 1.5 million thereafter each year. Line 74 is that appropriation for the two rail safety inspectors uh, moving that funding into the special revenue fund. Moving down to state roads, line 90 is another line on maintaining current service levels. These are from the trunk highway fund of 22.6 million and 24 and 35.7 million and 25 and ongoing. Line 91 is another piece of the uh, federal match from the IIJA bill. Uh, this is 22 million each year from the Trunk Highway Fund. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned this is under the Operations and Maintenance uh, Program under State Roads. Uh, line 92 is uh, funding for the Highways for Habitat Program that is created in the bill, and we'll talk about the program uh, when we walk through the policy language, I believe, and that's a one million appropriation one time in uh, fiscal year 24. Related to that on lines 93 and 94 are the con construction and maintenance of living snow fences along state roads. There's one million one time in fiscal year 24 from the general fund for construction uh, of some living snow fences along the highways and then ongoing maintenance of those is from the trunk highway fund on line 94 of 165,000 a year. Line 95 is related uh, is, is part of a traffic safety package that I believe was uh, part of a Senator Carlson bill, um, creating safe road zones, um, um, which are um, basically identifying uh, traffic safety uh, areas of uh, that could use improved traffic safety within uh, speed enforcement, construction mitigation, and the like. So this is an appropriation for MnDOT to do some one-time work from the general fund on safe road zones and public awareness of the issues around those. Uh, moving to the next page, line 104 is another maintaining current service levels under planning and research of state roads. That's from the trunk highway, 1.5 million and 24 and 2.3 million and 25 and ongoing. Moving on to program delivery under state roads, uh, line 112 is another maintaining current service levels, again from trunk highway, 17, roughly 18 million and 24 and 29 million and 25 and ongoing. Line 113 is another federal match amount. Uh, this is for program delivery from the trunk highway of 12 million a year. Line 114 is uh, an ongoing amount of 2 million a year from the trunk or from the general fund to maximize available climate funding uh, programs um, under under federal funding um, programs that might reduce carbon or improve transportation resilience. So this is an available amount to uh, maximize that federal funding. Line 115 is cost related to a clean fuel standard economic impact study and working group. Um, the study is research aimed at in, uh, uh, cutting transportation emissions. Uh, this amount is from the general fund and it's a $250,000 one-time appropriation in 24. Line 116 is related to a required land transfer uh, in Upper Sioux Agency Park, I believe. Um, and this is MnDOT's um, costs from the fiscal note related to that land transfer. This is related to the purchase, um, uh, appraisal, and demolition of an old, um, I believe it's an old trunk highway and a bridge in the park. This is on line 116, and it's 1.193 million one time from the general fund. Line 117 is another piece of the uh, traffic safety measures. Um, this is MnDOT's piece of doing some speed mitigation on rural high risk, high risk highways. This is a one time appropriation of $20 million from the general fund, and this money is available until the end of fiscal year 26. Line 118 is more uh, traffic safety work. This is speed mitigation in work zones, and that's a $300,000 one time appropriation from the general fund. Moving down to under state road construction, line 127 is a federal match for actual state road construction on line 127. Trunk highway money, this is 230.9 million and 24 and 199.8 million and 25 um, and then slightly reduced amounts ongoing in the tails. Uh, and this includes um, the new federal money and the state match for that money. Line 128 is a slight base increase from other new revenue raised within the Senate language. So this is uh, starting with 3.75 million 
um, of new trunk highway money starting and uh, starting in line uh, fiscal year 25 and 3.5 million a year thereafter. Uh, similarly, on line 135, this is new revenue uh, related to increases in the bill uh, for quarters of commerce. Again, 3.75 million in 25 and 3.5 million ongoing, all from trunk highway. Uh, let's see, on line 142, a highway debt service related to trunk highway bonding authorizations in the bill. This is from the trunk highway fund of 4.36 million and 24, 18.7 and 25 and increasing thereafter. Uh, statewide radio communications, lines 149 and 150. Uh, 149 is another maintaining current service levels uh, uh, from the Trunk Highway Fund, 414,024, 668,025 and thereafter. Uh, line 150 is a governor's recommendation uh, to replace two armor radio towers. This is one-time funding of $2 million from the general fund in 24. Moving down to local roads on lines 165 through 167, these are changes to county state aid highway appropriations. Uh, 165 is a slight reduction uh, related to some spending under Department of Public Safety in the bill from the, H, from the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund. Um, that um, Highway User Tax Distribution Fund money is a flow through to trunk highway and state aid funds. So once that money is spent off the top, there is less money to flow through. So this reflects that uh, slight reduction on line 165. And similarly on 176, that is the reduction related to that on for municipal state aid. On line 167, this is a base adjustment from uh, increased uh, revenues to the HUTDF related to uh, Article 3 uh, changes that we'll go over. So these would be increased appropriations to the county state aid from the county state aid fund, 95.35 million in fiscal year 24 and 164.4 million in 25 and increasing thereafter. Similarly, uh, municipal state aid has increases related to the new revenue on line 178 of 10.2 million in 24 and 22.5 million in 25 and increasing. Other local roads start on 185. This is a governor's recommendation to create a local transportation disaster support account. This is to reimburse locals for federal cost shares for um, Federal Highway Administration Emergency Relief Program. Uh, the federal, it's a 20% um, cost share with the feds and the state has uh, traditionally picked up those costs for emergencies for locals. Uh, this is creating an ongoing fund to be able to more readily fund those pieces and that's from the general fund. That is 4.3 million in 24 and 1 million a year thereafter. On lines 187 and 188 are one-time appropriations from the general fund for local road improvement program and local bridges of 45 million in each year from the general fund and those, money, those uh, amounts are available until the end of fiscal year 27. On lines 189 and 190 are statutory appropriations from the existing small cities assistance account and the created larger cities assistance account in the bill. Um, and this is a statutory appropriation established to spend revenue related to the auto part sales tax and other surcharge revenue raised in the bill. So uh, those amounts are, are equal on 189 and 190, 18.1 million uh, from each. Uh, in 24 and 20.3 million from each in 25. Under MnDOT agency management, uh, there's a couple of pieces on 204 and 205 related to maintaining current service levels, both from the general fund and the trunk highway fund. General fund is 19,024 and 31,000 a year thereafter. Trunk highway is 8.4 million in 24 and 13.4 million in 25 and thereafter. Uh, there's a number of pieces related to federal match money for IJA in this area as well on lines 206 through 208. 206 and 207 are both for um, uh, matching for multimodal discretionary uh, grants, uh, 116.4 million from the general fund for the, that match. Uh, 207 is 100 million for that purpose, uh, specifically to help local governments with that match. And those amounts are both available till fiscal year 27. Line 208 is the federal matching for the electric vehicle infrastructure program. That's 13.6 million one time from the general fund available until 2027. 
Uh, and on 209 is the program staffing ongoing from the general fund to staff the new uh, National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program funded with the federal funds. And that's 190,000 a year from the general fund. Line 210 is a one-time appropriation of $2 million from the general fund to fund uh, technical assistance grants um, related to the new federal funds to help um, uh, basically local governments to um, apply for maybe discretionary grants under the IIJ program. On line 211 is uh, another IIJ match for agency services. This is $5 million a year. Um, from the Trunk Highway Fund. On line 212 is a governor's rec uh, for tribal affairs training programs. It's a one million a year from the general fund. 900,000 of that is for a construction skills training um, program and 100,000 is for ongoing tribal state relations training that the, the, uh, that the agency performs. Line 213 is a partial funding of a governor's rec for strategic technology system investments, just IT updates and modernization for the agency. That is from the general fund of 3.5 million in 24 and 2 million a year thereafter. Line 214 is a statutory appropriation from the new, newly created disadvantaged communities car sharing grants account. This is funded through a transfer from the general fund of 500,000 one time in 24. Moving down to buildings on line 223, this is to maintain current service levels from the Trunk Highway Fund of 541,000 and 24 and 871,000 and 25 and thereafter. And line 224 is eliminating an open appropriation that's starting in fiscal year 26 um, to cover the costs of the MnDOT Central Office building from the general fund. That was established in the last budget bill. Um, historically, the costs and all operations costs of MnDOT are covered by the Trunk Highway Fund. Um, and then the last budget bill that was switched to an open appropriation and starting in 26 from the general fund and, and the current bill eliminates that appropriation. So there's a pickup of 6.5 million assumed uh, from the general fund starting in 26. <clears throat> and that ends the Department of Transportation. Uh, very briefly, Metropolitan Council change items are on 249 and 250. Uh, 249 is a one-time appropriation of $50 million from the general fund in 2024 for the Blue Line Extension Light Rail Transit, that's the Botno Line. Uh, line 250 is one million uh, one-time appropriation from the general fund for a mandated land use and transportation study in the bill that has to be completed by June 30th, 2024, I believe. And then moving on to Department of Public Safety. Um, there are a number of maintaining current service levels uh, lines as well. You'll see on 265 under DPS administration, Office of Communications, that's a general fund appropriation of 101,024, 133,025 and ongoing for maintaining current service. Line 266 is a governor's rec partially funded in the bill uh, for um, more DPS administrative staffing. Uh, I believe the governor's request was for 13 FTEs and this would fund 6.5 FTEs. Uh, 110,000 in 24 and 220,000 25 and thereafter from the general fund. Public safety support on lines 273 and 274, maintaining current service levels from general fund and trunk highway fund, uh, 260,000 in 24 and 353,000 in 25 and after from the general fund, 536,000 in 24 and 818,000 in 25 from the trunk highway fund. Line 270, oh, sorry, 276 um, is a governor's rec to add a second staff person to the State Rail Safety Oversight Office that is oversight of light rail transit lines. Uh, that would be 20,000 a year from the general fund. Um, this is to leverage federal funds that would pay for the remainder of that position. Line 277 is a governor's rec, a partially funded governor's rec on additional staff to engage in uh, community engagement um, activities for the department and this is from the general fund of 371,000 a year. Uh, line 278 is another piece of the requested um, increase for administrative staff. This is from the general fund under public safety support, 651,024, 1.3 million a year thereafter. Uh, line 279 is a statutory appropriation related to the rail safety provisions that will be discussed in a bit. Um, this is for, this is a statutory appropriation of 100,000 from new assessment revenues um, to fund emergency response teams related to derailments. 
<clears throat> um, under technology and support services, there are just some more pieces on the maintaining current service levels on 297 and 298 from the general fund and the trunk highway fund. And in the interest of time, I, I won't read all those numbers unless <laughs> you want me to, Mr. Chair. Moving on to state patrol, on line 313, there is an operating deficiency request, uh, that's a governor's request, um, under the fiscal year 2023 change items column of 6.7 million from the trunk highway fund. Um, I should point out that state patrol is funded almost entirely from trunk highway fund except for capital security, which is funded from general fund. So this would be an increase just in 23 for 6.7 million. Um, line 314 is more maintaining current service levels. That is from the trunk highway fund for state patrol. Line 315 is a governor's recommendation for a one-time appropriation of 14.5 million from the general fund for a helicopter purchase for the patrol, and that money is available until the end of fiscal year 25. And uh, along with that, uh, another part of the recommendation is the staffing for additional pilots um, related to the helicopter purchase. That's on line 316. That money is from the Trunk Highway Fund of 1.7 million per year. Lines 317 and 318 are, are GovRec um, to uh, achieve and maintain credentialing, uh, uh, accreditation under the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies. Uh, this is a, a a major credentialing authority uh, in cooperation with major law enforcement, major executive organizations. Um, and this would require two FTEs to achieve and maintain the accreditation. Um, the governor's direct funded it from the general fund and the Senate language funds it from the trunk highway fund, 611,024 and 352,000 a year thereafter. Line 319 is a one-time appropriation from the general fund, also a governor's rec, for design costs of a new state patrol facility, 350,000 one-time from the general fund, and 24, and that money is available until the end of fiscal year 27. <clears throat> Moving on to commercial vehicle enforcement on page eight, uh, line 29, 329 is a trunk highway appropriation related to maintaining current service levels in the department. Line 330 is a uh, an ongoing appropriation from the Trunk Highway Fund um, to for some federal match money under commercial vehicle enforcement to add additional troopers and inspectors, and that's 5.2 million a year. Uh, under capital security, uh, 330, line 337, this is another maintaining current service levels. This one is from the general fund um, for capital security. Uh, lines 344 and 345 under, are under the Vehicle Crimes Unit of the State Patrol. Line 344 is a piece of the operating deficiency. This is funded directly from the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund, which is how the Vehicle Crimes Unit base is funded. And 345 is an um, HUTDF funded uh, amount ongoing for maintaining current service levels. Moving on to driver and vehicle services. Uh, lines 358 and 370 under driver and vehicle services are maintaining current service levels. These appropriations are all from special revenue funds that are funded through fees assessed by uh, driver and vehicle services and are directly appropriated by the legislature. Line 360 is a governor's recommendation on collecting race and ethnicity info on driver's license credentials. Um, that amount on line 360 is 262,024 and 81,000 a year thereafter. This is, um, I believe a staffing amount for uh, anticipated increased data requests once this data is collected. Line 360, oh, I'm sorry, 362 as a one-time appropriation of 750,000 from the special revenue account um, to fund uh, equipment costs for driver's license agents um, who are becoming full service providers and offering um, deputy registrar uh, services as well, I believe. Um, line 363 is administrative costs, staffing costs for uh, the inclusion of online driver's education in the bill, and this is 115,024 and 109,000 a year thereafter from the Special Revenue Fund. On vehicle services, on 371, there is a reduction to the direct appropriation um, due to the department using an existing open appropriation, and this is for the plate fulfillment um, provisions of manufacturing and, sh and mailing uh, license plates. So the direct appropriation is reduced by 8.2 million a year. Line 372 is additional funding to um, establish five new vehicle inspection sites around the state. There are currently three, so this would increase to eight of 1.6 million and 24 and 1.3 million a year thereafter from special revenue account. 
line 373 is uh, staffing increased costs related to, um, uh, as we'll talk about in a bit, um, full service providers, deputy registrars, and driver's license agents under the bill will now be allowed to issue records that currently are issued only by DVS, driver and vehicle uh, records. So this is staffing at the department to audit the issuance of those records. Uh, line 374 is staffing related to um, a disciplinary and appeals process related to accessing data uh, on driver and vehicle services records. And those are both funded through special revenue funds and are ongoing. Uh, line 375 are distributions to full service providers and deputy registrars. This is funded through, um, uh, we'll talk about this in article four, I believe. Uh, this is funded through one time general fund transfers of 10 million in 24 and 25 to the full service provider account and then distributed to full service providers and deputy registrars. And then in 26 and 27, the amounts are related to <clears throat> new surcharges that are collected and deposited in the full service provider account and distributed accordingly. Moving down to traffic safety, uh, lines 387 and 388 are maintaining current service levels for the Office of Traffic Safety from the General Fund and the Trunk Highway Fund. Line 389 is related to the governor's recommendation on race and ethnicity info collection for driver's licenses. Um, and this is to create a statewide traffic safety equity program. This is a general fund appropriation of 98,000 a year. Line 391 is a governor's recommendation uh, for a new traffic safety data analytics center from the general fund. Um, this is a uh, this is a partial funding of the governor's rec, 407,000 in 24 and 813,000 a year thereafter from the general fund. Line 392 is ongoing appropriations of 2 million a year from the general fund for a new traffic safety advisory council. That's also a governor's recommendation. Lines 393 and 394 are for public awareness campaigns. Uh, one is related to school bus safety and one is related to the move over law on highways, and these are uh, line 393 is 50,000 one time and 394 is 100,000 one time from general fund. Line 395, well, let's see, lines 395 through 399, I believe are all related to um, Senator Carlson's traffic safety um, provisions bill. Um, and these are all one-time appropriations from the general fund for the Office of Traffic Safety to perform various activities, including targeted speed reduction efforts, uh, local grants for safe ride programs, and speed mitigation efforts. Uh, let's see, um, pipeline safety, there's no change item there. Uh, going down to line 417, this is related to the rail safety provisions later in the bill. Um, this is a distribution from uh, a statutory appropriation from assessments collected on railroads and pipeline companies um, for railroad and pipeline response preparedness, and that is to the state fire marshal under de uh, Department of Public Safety of three million a year in 24, three million in 24, and 2.3 million starting in 25. So that ends. Uh, the Department of Public Safety. There's just a few other pieces I'll go through very quickly. On lines 427 and 428 are appropriations for um, corridor commissions around the state that, um, that would be funded through the Department of Transportation. Um, the corridor commissions do programming um, and assistance work with companies and commuters to work on transit, carpool, telework, et cetera. Um, the 494 corridor commission has an appropriation of 300,000 a year starting and 24 from the general fund on line 427, and then appropriations on line 428 for tr transportation management organizations in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and a newly created um, organization in Southeast Minneapolis, Minnesota. or Southeast Minnesota, I'm sorry, Southeast Minnesota. Uh, and that would be 350,000 of the 24 appropriation is for Southeast Minnesota, the new one, and ongoing appropriations uh, for Minneapolis and St. Paul. On line 433 is uh, an additional $2 million from the general fund one time for school bus stop arm camera grants. These were funded at roughly 15 million in the last budget bill and this is an additional 2 million uh, in 24 for that purpose. Lines four, oh, line 440 is a statutory appropriation um, from the collections of the Metro sales and use tax for the Department of Revenue collection costs. Uh, 453,000 and 24 and 702,000 and 25 and amount, slightly increasing amount thereafter. 
Line 446 is an appropriation to the University of Minnesota uh, for some small community partnerships with local uh, governments to do project analysis and development of infrastructure projects. Um, this is in our bill because I believe the appropriation originally went to Department of Transportation for a grant to University of Minnesota and the appropriation was changed directly to university and it, it stayed in our bill. These are one-time appropriations of one million a year in 24 and 25 from the general fund. Uh, let's see, line 452 is a carry for cancellation and carry forward of staffing related to uh, MnDOT's freight network tool development that's in conjunction with the Department of Employment and Economic Development and that's from the general fund as well. That's $30,000 carry forward. Uh, line 458 is a statutory appropriation to pollution control agency related to rail safety uh, measures later in the bill uh, of 140,000 a year from special revenue fund funded by assessments for railroad discharge preparedness. Line 464 is a statutory appropriation from the data security account for the Office of the Legislative Auditor. Uh, 310,000 in 24 and 212,000 in 25. Uh, and then moving on to transfers starting on line 481. This is a one-time transfer from the general fund to the trunk highway fund for federal funds match under IIJA. Uh, this is 323,112,024. On line 482 is a transfer from the general fund to the disadvantaged communities car sharing grant account. Uh, that was touched on earlier. That's a one-time transfer of 500,000 and 24. Line 483 is an tr uh, ongoing transfer from the general fund to the active transportation account uh, for grants through MnDOT. That is from the general fund to that account of 25 million each in 24-25 and a roughly 2.8 million a year thereafter. Uh, line 484 is related to rail safety um, measures again. This is an, an uh, ongoing transfer from the railroad pipeline safety account funded through assessments to the grade crossing safety account for MnDOT to do infrastructure improvements, um, $750,024 and $1.45 million thereafter. On line 487 are the one-time transfers from the general fund to the full service provider account for DVS to be distributed to full service providers in those years, 10 million a year. Lines 488 and 489 are related to, uh, in the bill, uh, DVS currently has a driver services operating account and a vehicle services operating account. The bill contains a GovRec to combine these into one new DVS operating account. So there are some necessary mechanisms that have to happen in 20, at the end of 23 that the existing balances in those accounts will be transferred to the new account. And that's on line 48 and 49. Um, I'll walk briefly through the revenues, Mr. Chair. Line 496 is revenues related to the vehicle registration tax changes to the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund of 241.6 million in the first biennium and 546 in the second biennium. Lines 497 through 502 are related to the auto parts sales tax dedication. In current law, auto parts sales tax, um, a, a set figure of 145 million each year is deposited in the HETDF and the re remainder goes to the general fund. This would, phase in, uh, this would phase out the general fund dedication into the HETDF and some various other transportation funds, uh, county state aid, municipal state aid, small cities assistance and larger cities assistance. So um, you can see on line 497, that is the reduction to the general fund over time of 42.3 in 24-25 and 91.2 in 26-27, and then the amounts transferred to the other transportation accounts on the lines below, or not transferred, but deposited. Lines 503 and 504 are changes related to the motor vehicle sales tax increase, current law at 6.5%, and the bill increases it to 6.87%. Um, so that is an increase, uh, uh, the motor vehicle sales tax funds the HUTDF and transit assistance accounts for Metro and Greater Minnesota. So the HUTD increase is on line 503 of 62.4 million in 24-25, 66.5 in the tails. And then on line 504 accompanying the tax increase is a split uh, relative to current law between Metro and Greater Minnesota Transit. Um, increasing the amount to Greater Minnesota Transit and slightly decreasing the amount to Metro Transit. Um, but this overall is the increase to the transit account from the increase to 6.875. Uh, on line 505, this is the piece of the Metro new Metro sales and use tax, the half percent tax that would go into the CASA fund and fund local county roads in the Metro 
and that is 104.4 million in 24 and 25, and 132.8 million in the tails. Lines 506 through 508 are related to the tab fee renewal surcharge of 750 um, on any tab fee renewals, and that revenue is split evenly between the town road account and then small cities and larger cities assistance accounts. And those are 36.4 million each in 24 and 25, and 38 million each uh, in the tails. Oh, let's see. Um, no, line 511 is the assessments on railroads to uh, fund the new rail, uh, the two positions for rail safety inspectors that are moving out of the general fund. So that would be 600,000 for the biennium on line 511 and for each biennium, 600,000. Line 512 is the uh, transfer in uh, to the trunk highway fund from the general fund for the federal funds match above 323 million. Line 513 is the transfer into the disadvantaged communities car sharing grant account in the special revenue fund from the general fund of 500,000 one time. Line 514 is the uh, ongoing transfer from the general fund to the existing active transportation account of uh, 50 million in the first biennium and 7.2 in the tails. <clears throat> Uh, line 515 is a transfer from that railroad pipeline safety account to grade crossing safety account to fund MnDOT infrastructure investments. Uh, under Metropolitan Council, line 518 is the uh, um, revenue from the Metro sales and use tax, the half percent tax uh, dedicated to transit and active transportation. That is 500, roughly 510 million in 24 and 25, 648.2 million in the tails. Line 519 is the uh, Metro Transit piece of that MVEST increase to 6.875% along with the new split between Metro and Greater Minnesota Transit. Overall, it's an increase of 6 million in 24 and 25 and 6.5 million in the tails to Metro Transit. And then there's a number of pieces under DPS. Uh, 522 is the 4 million a year railroad and pipeline assessments that, serve, that funds various provisions throughout the bill. Lines 523 and 524 is a governor's rec to create a new special plate, the blackout special plates, the black plates with the white lettering. Um, and the um, governor's recommendation, it, it raises an additional um, 3.6 million in 24 and 4.8 million in 25. That's related to a $30 contribution on top of plate fees. Uh, the governor's recommendation has that deposited in the DVS operating account. Senate language has it deposited in the trunk highway fund. Line 525 is uh, allow, it's a governor's recommendation using uh, allowing the use of social security number for revenue recapture, releasing that info to the Department of Revenue for debt collection. That would uh, that revenue is 1.6 million estimated in 24 and 36,000 a year thereafter, and that's deposited in uh, DVS operation accounts. Lines 526 is related to eliminating a knowledge test for driver's licenses uh, if, if the applicant possesses an out-of-state, a valid out-of-state license. So that would be slightly decreased revenue of 116,024, 125,000 a year thereafter for DVS. 527 is a filing fee increase for DVS um, uh, that goes into the operating account I'm sorry, I lost my place. That goes into the DVS operating account, 623,024, 831,000 a year thereafter. Uh, 520, I'm sorry, 528, 529 are related to the new reintegration license and a loss of fee revenue because no fee is allowed for that license. Um, and these are slight losses to the special revenue accounts and the general fund on 528 and 529. Uh, 531 is the reinstatement of a sunsetted uh, 75 cent driver's license fee, and that will bring in slightly less than a million dollars a year to DVS operating accounts. Line 532 is a DVS credential fee increase. This is a $6 increase on driver's licenses and, and uh, identification cards, and that is uh, 8.9 million in revenue per year to DVS operations. 533, or I'm sorry, 534. Um, is a slight revenue loss for DVS related to full service providers now issuing records that DVS solely issued before. Uh, line 530, oh, I'm sorry, 535 is a new $1 surcharge on all online transactions related to vehicles, and that is deposited in the uh, full service provider account in the special revenue fund starting in fiscal year 26, estimated to bring in $1.3 million a year. 
uh, and that amount is distributed to deputy registrars and full service providers. Line 536 is a transfer in from the general fund to the full service provider account uh, and distributed to full service providers in 24 and 25, 10 million a year. Some slight revenues for Department of Revenue. Um, there's some income tax interactions related to the vehicle registration tax changes. So that's decreased revenue on line 540 to the general fund um, for Department of Revenue. Uh, Metro sales and use tax costs of collection on line 541 uh, from the special revenue fund. Uh, that's revenue in from the sales and use tax and the appropriation was up above in the spreadsheet. Line 542 is reduced revenue related to a new electric assisted bicycle tax credit in two years um, and that those revenues would be uh, reduced in 25 and 26. Um, reduced income tax revenue. And then on line 543, this is an exemption in the bill, a uh, car sharing uh, exemption. And Mr. Chair, I'm almost done. Um, I'm just going to point out the general fund summary starting on line 567. I've already gone over the targets and how they were met. Um, and should I go on to the bonding and stuff? Will we do that no, first? I want to describe the bonding. Yeah. Okay. Well, I are you done with the, I'm the done. spreadsheet? Okay. I'm done. Yeah, I want you to describe the okay. And Mr. Chair, that sums up the spreadsheet. If there are no questions, um, I'll turn to the language for some other pieces. Okay. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, two things in the appropriations article I just wanted to point out that weren't captured in the spreadsheet, really. Um, on, on page 17 of the second engrossment, um, starting on line 17.15. These are transfers. This is amounts that flow into the flexible highway account from the HUTDF every year. Um, that account is at the commissioner's discretion um, to spend within certain parameters, within certain allowable uses. And in the budget bill every two years, we state what those uses will be. Um, so on line 1718, you can see that 1.85 million of that amount is going to the trunk highway fund from that flexible highway account. On line 17, 25 million is going to the municipal turn back account from the flexible highway account and the remainder each year is going to the county turn back account. Um, tradition, or historically, these, amount, these uh, amounts have been used mostly, mostly for turn backs um, of local roads or two local roads. Uh, and then on line, or page 27, section eight of article one, this is not reflected on the spreadsheet. Um, this is related to uh, trunk highway bonding for quarters of commerce that was in 2018. And there is new language added on lines 28.24 to 28.31, stating that any remaining amount of the appropriation uh, of that bonding authorization is for a newly named project at the intersection of Mark Trunk Highway 9 and Mark Trunk Highway 23 in the city of New London. Those are the only piece I want to point out in Article 1, so I'll walk through Article 2 briefly. That starts on page uh, 34, and this is the Trunk Highway Bonding article. Uh, this contains $550 million in Trunk Highway bonds, new authorization. $350 million of the bonds are for Corridors of Commerce program under MnDOT, and that is split $175 million per year in 24 and 25. There's an additional 200 million of bonding for state road construction regular program, uh, and that's split 100 million each in 24 and 25. And then of course, bond, uh, regular bond sale expenses of 550,000 um, also split to reflect the bonding amounts. And then article three is the transportation finance article. I walked through the revenues already, so I'll just point out the sections very quickly. Um, Section, this starts on page 37. Sections one through three relates to the small cities assistance account that exists in statute, but we're adding a, um, uh, the bill adds an annual appropriate, a statutory appropriation to that because now the small cities assistance account will have dedicated revenue. So that's annually appropriated the commissioner. And then sections two and three are just conforming changes with that change. Section four is the creation of the larger cities assistance account. And I should point out quickly that the difference is that small cities are with population under 5,000. Larger cities are those over 5,000 that would otherwise be eligible for, um, that are eligible for uh, municipal state aid funds as well. So this creates the account in section four, makes the appropriation of the commissioner um, and states the distribution to the cities that are eligible. 
Section five are the changes related to the vehicle registration tax. Um, you'll see on line 39.1 and 39.4 are the tax changes, the tax rate changes. Um, most importantly, 39.4 changes from 1.285% to 1.575% for vehicles initially registered after November 2020. And then the depreciation schedule um, that calculates the tax changes on page 40. The depreciation schedule is slightly slowed uh, on lines 40.1 through 40.9. And then the minimum tax rate is reduced by $5 on 40.11 from $25 to $20. Right, and I'll point out existing law states on 40.12 through 40.15 um, that for any vehicle previously registered in Minnesota, the total amount due under the new calculation will not exceed the smallest total amount previously paid. So the new calculation will be run, but no one will pay more than they paid in the previous year for an existing registration. Uh, line, or section six on page 40 is the new Minnesota blackout special license plates that I talked about. And you'll see on uh, 40.27, that the additional contribution is uh, deposited in the trunk highway fund. Uh, section seven is the existing trans active transportation account adding a statutory appropriation to reflect ongoing um, uh, deposits in that account now. Uh, section eight is the auto part sales tax dedication phase in. You'll see that language start on 43.3. Um, 47.5 percent each year to the highway user tax distribution fund then the amount to the general fund is phased out out through 2033 at which point at zero percent uh, and the remainder in each year after those two dedications is split 60 percent to county state aid highways 22 percent to municipal state aid streets and nine percent each to small cities and large cities roads accounts um, the Metro sales tax uh, increase, or establishment, I should say, of 0.5% is in several sections, starting on line 45, or page 45. Section 9 is just a conforming change. The tax is created in section 10 on page 46, um, and there lists the sales tax imposition, the rate of one half of 1%, uh, where it is collected in the metro area, and the deposit, 83% will be deposited in the Metropolitan Area Transit Account, which is statutorily appropriated to Met Council for transit, and 17% in the County State Aid Highway Fund, and that amount is only for the metro counties under, this, under these provisions. Um, let's see, and lines, or I'm sorry, sections 11 and 12 are changes related to the motor vehicle sales tax. Uh, 47.18 line there, you'll see the increase from 6.5 to 6.875%. And then on section 12, uh, starting really at the top of page 48, is the change in percentage between Metro and Greater Minnesota transit accounts. And then section 13 is another uh, a section related to the Metro sales tax. These are allowable uh, and desired use of funds, both by the Met Council and then distribution formulas for the Department of Transportation for the road piece. That's on page 49 in subdivision three, I believe. That's it, and now we'll pass it on to Mr. Greenfield if there are no questions. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, um, Article 4 is um, the entirety of Senate File 2099 um, mentioned previously in the A51 amendment discussion. Um, Senate File 2099 made various changes to the driver and vehicle services processes to implement the recommendations from the driver and vehicle services report of the independent expert review that was submitted to the legislature on January 12, 2022. The IER, or Independent Expert Review, sought to understand current operational processes and workflows within the DVS ecosystem and how deputy registrars and driver's license agents fit in within that system. Um, so I'm going to kind of chunk some sections together um, and kind of explain how that fits into the overall IER report. Uh, on page 50, uh, there, section 1 provides the definition of a full service provider. And a full service provider is a person who performs both the functions of a deputy registrar and a full service driver's license agent. And there are um, a variety of different sections that follow from that definition of a full service provider um, that are put forth in the bill. So sections one, two, three, four, and five on pages 50 to 52 are a variety of customer service provisions that are afforded then to full service providers. 
Section two authorizes full service providers to issue driver's, uh, driver's records. Section three allows a full service provider to impose a surcharge for those requests. Section four creates an exemption to that surcharge. And section five requires the Commissioner of Public Safety to monitor and audit full service providers that provide documents as provided in section three of article four. Uh, section six is quite a lengthy and um, substantive section that is kind of independent, so I'll have Ms. Boyd explain the importance of Article 4, Section 6, which begins on page 52, line 27. Thank you. Mr. Chair, this um, Article 6, or I'm sorry, Section 6 contains a number of different pieces. On line 53.3, you'll see that's the new 750 surcharge um, on the fee for every vehicle registration renewal, and that amount is... Um, as I mentioned earlier, the amount of the revenue is split between the town road account and small cities and larger cities assistance uh, accounts for roads. And then on line 50, or you can see that split starting on 54.3 where the surcharge revenue is deposited. Line 54.10 um, is a $1 surcharge on each online vehicle transaction. Those amounts must be deposited in the full service provider account, which is then distributed, I'm sorry, distributed to full service providers. Line 54.14 is a new 50 cent surcharge on every uh, transaction conducted at a deputy, re these are collected by deputy registrars and those revenues are retained by deputy registrars. And I should mention that paragraphs G and H are only effective starting in fiscal year 26. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, picking back up, um, section seven through 10, um, beginning on page 54, all the way through page 57, um, are additional provisions related to uh, the creation of a full service provider, um, such as allowing an FSP to give vehicle information, registration information over the phone to the owner or lessee of a vehicle, allows, uh, section eight allows FSPs to provide accident reports, collect fees for the service, and set forth of the portion to be remitted to the commissioner by an FSP. Um, section nine is another monitoring and auditing provision. Section 10 is a definitional cross-reference in the driver's license statute, so we define both a full service provider in the um, vehicle registration statute under chapter 168 and the driver's license uh, statute, a, a chapter of law, one, chapter 171. Section 11 uh, on page 57, line 28, allows for a pre-application process uh, for uh, any person um, submitting for a driver's license uh, or identification card, but requires that person to complete the pre-application process in person. Section 12 on page 58 increases the filing fees for new applications or renewal applications for a non-compliant, real ID compliant, or enhanced driver's license or identification card. Section 13 on page 59 is the first of the independent expert Sorry. reviews um, exam, driver's exam related uh, recommendations. This um, requires the Commissioner of Public Safety to publish the driver's manual and study materials for both the written exam and the study exam. The support materials must focus on the subjects that are most commonly failed by test takers. Section 14 on page 59 that wraps into page 60 is the independent expert reviews recommended changes for securing auditing processes on MinDrive. Um, there are some provisions that uh, address the fact that people were shut out of or completely uh, removed from accessing MinDrive due to uh, accessing the system for certain types of lookups. And there are, there are other people who have been shut out of MinDrive uh, for more legitimate reasons, um, such as an improper access of data. This kind of addresses that issue. Um, and I think that that is the, um, the broadest piece of section uh, 14 um, and the amendment A51 brought in a new piece as well. Uh, section 15 on page 60 uh, addresses exam stations, the minimum number of exam stations authorized by statute. Section 16 on page 62 is the uh, written examination waiver requirement that was discussed uh, by Ms. Boyd. This waives the written examination for any driver's license applicant if they have a validly issued driver's license in another jurisdiction. And then um, section 17 is another exam related piece of um, uh, change related to the student pass rates for taking the driver's exam. And then sections 18 through 21 on article four are um, changes related to the creation of a DVS operating account that Ms. Boyd can discuss. 
Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't, I don't think I need to add anything else to that one. Just I mentioned that the operating accounts will be combined into one. And I believe that is also encompassed as part of Article 5. Um, Article 6 begins on page, I just will give you the brief page to start, on page 79. Article 6, 6 contains a variety of provisions pertaining to the Metropolitan Council and incorporates a variety of provisions related to its governance and operations, including transit safety provisions and enforcement activities on public transit. That's sections 1, 3 to 4, 16 to 18, 26 to 30, 33 and 36. Uh, there's also the designation of MnDOT as the commissioner, uh, MnDOT commissioner's responsible authority for non-arterial bus, bus rapid transit projects above $100 million. There's a Senate uh, climate action plan that governs the requirements of a climate action plan and the Metropolitan Council's long-term comprehensive plan. There is a creation of an active transportation plan program in section seven of article six uh, relating to active transportation through the Metropolitan Council. There is a post-COVID transit ridership study in Article 6 uh, affecting or studying the impact on public transit uh, and ridership numbers after the pandemic. There's Senate file 1940, uh, 1933, the Metro Mobility Enhancement Pilot Program. And then there are a variety of provisions in Article 6 that also deal with reforms to the Metropolitan Council uh, and its governance, including sections 19 through 24, uh, incorporating the Office of Legislative Auditor's recommended recommendations based on the report that was issued in February or March of 2023. Uh, sections 31 is an amendment to session law about the Southwest Light Rail Transit um, reporting expenditure requirements. And section 32 is the Charter Commission on Metropolitan Go uh, Governance that was authored by Senator Dibble that establishes a charter commission um, for the potential, uh, for a potential charter submission to the voters in the 2024 election. Article seven, um, moving on, is the entirety of Senate file 912, which is the Bill Dooley Bicycle Safety Act. That begins on page 112 on line 21. Um, and there are no substantive changes um, to the first engrossment of Senate File 912. It allows for active transportation safety training in public school districts through K through 8 pupils, and MnDOT must provide the collection of training materials. It creates an active transportation advisory committee to participate in a variety of bicycle related, bicycle -related programming. It designates bikeways and establishes the rules of the road for bicyclists, including passing, riding rules, and authorizing what is known as the Idaho stop. And then Article 8 is a kind of grab bag of a variety of um, Senate provisions. I will try to go as high level as I possibly can, but um, note that um, the first section is a data security account appropriation to the Office of the Legislative Auditor. Section 2 is the Advisory Council on Traffic Safety that was mentioned. That is Senator Carlson's bill. There's a lot of these sections related to Senator Carlson's traffic safety bill contained in Article 8. Section three on page 124 is a governor uh, is a um, governor's initiative related to the collection of race and ethnicity data on driver's licenses. Sections four through nine, beginning on page 126 and carrying uh, through page 129 is Senate file 3187. This was Senator Kupek's rail safety provisions and has a variety of changes to the pollution control statute uh, relating to emergency response, uh, simulation exercises, and uh, a variety of different um, response capability requirements for railroads when a discharge of oil or other hazardous substances occurs. Section 10 on page 129 is Senate file 718. That's the Highways for Habitat program. That essentially uh, creates a integrated roadside vegetation management program. Um, Section 11 on page 131 is a chair initiative uh, relating to the Department of Transportation's Operations Center. Sections 12 through 17, beginning on page 132, wrapping through 137, uh, is Senator Jasinski's Corridors of Commerce Selection Process Criteria Modification. Section 18 on page 137 uh, is again Senate File 2790. This relates to the Department of Transportation's responsibility to impact, uh, to analyze greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector and to um, 
potentially interlink, interlink mitigation methods if um, a certain plan project has a, a certain uh, threshold of uh, expected emissions. Uh, sections 19 through 21 is uh, Senator McEwen's 25, Senate file 2591. This deals with the right of way for uh, utilities along uh, highways for the installation of certain uh, electric infrastructure. Um, Section 22 is a chair initiative relating to the Center for Transportation Studies at the University of Minnesota. That's on page 142. Section 23 on page 143 is the maximum documentation fees an, uh, an auto dealer can charge. Section 24 on page 123 is the definition of an e-bike. Section 25, I believe, is another. Um, se sections 25 through 27 is another uh, consolidation of sections from Senator Carlson's traffic safety bill. Um, there are a variety of sections here beginning on page 144 through 145, um, including safe road zones, the speed limits in safe road zones, and what is known as move over or slow down law um, that is being expanded to any vehicle uh, displaying its flashing emergency lights that's pulled over on the road, on, onto the roadside. Section 28 is a uh, pr definition of blindness for physical disability for a disability placard. Section 29 and 30 are again um, traffic safety provisions contained in Senator Carlson's bill. This is a clarification on the hands-free law related to the use of a cellular device while uh, operating a vehicle. Um, section 31, 32 are um, individual pieces related to tow truck weight limit exemptions, as well as um, language regarding a, um, a relative, uh, relative of a, a person with a disability accessing a driver's license at the age of 15. It's just an expansion of the medical license provision um, that is already in current law. Sections Section 33 is the authorization for both teleconference and online driver's education. That begins on page 150. Section 34 on page 152 is a uh, increase of the fees for all driver's licenses and, non and identification cards. Section 35 on page 154 is, again, uh, a section related to the collection of race and ethnicity data, the optional collection of that data on driver's license applications. Section 36 is um, a provision that essentially clarifies the veteran's designation on a driver's license to allow for more paperwork, uh, different types of uh, veterans discharge paperwork, and also allows an active member of the National Guard to receive the veteran's designation. Section 37 on page 156 is the reintegration driver's license. Let's see, section 38. Section 38 and 39 are the sections of law that begin on page 159 through 160 that authorize both teleconference driver's education and online driver's education. Sections 40 and 41 are related to the climate action plan related to the Department of Transportation as discussed um, earlier in both Article 6 and Article 8. Section 42 is the first section that relates to the disadvantaged car, uh, communities car sharing grant that's been mentioned by both Ms. Boyd and Senator Dibble. Um, this establishes a, a car sharing grant, grant program in disadvantaged communities. Section 43 is the electric vehicle infrastructure program establishment. Section 44 through 46 uh, are various provisions related to rail safety. Um, section 47 is um, Senator McEwen's Senate File 1417, the two-man crew provision that sets a minimum number of crew persons for certain rail, uh, railroads uh, and operating in certain corridors. Section 48 is, I believe, a, another uh, section related to Senator McEwen's 2591, the right of way for uh, certain utilities uh, related to electric vehicle infrastructure. Section 49 is the uh, electric bike tax credit provision that begins on page 170, line 17. Page uh, fifth, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, page 172 um, and uh, has both sections 50 and 51. Those are um, modifications to, uh, to the 
underlying tax law that are related to Senate File 673, the disadvantaged communities car sharing grant. Section 52 is a traffic safety report. Um, this is on page 173. This is another one of Senator Carlson's traffic safety provisions. Section 53 is uh, a, the final section that pertains to um, Senator Kupek's 3187, the rail safety bill, and that begins on page 174. Section 54 on page 177, line 25, is the, uh, the, mention, the change that uh, Ms. Boyd mentioned relating to the registration of meteorological towers no longer being required and the collection of the $50 fee no longer, no longer being required. Um, by the Department of Transportation. Section 55 on page 178 uh, is a provision relating to the expansion of a deputy registrar's office at the North Minneapolis Service Center. Section 56 on page 178 is a clean transportation uh, fuel study group. Section 57 on page 179 is a study on electric vehicle tax and registration fees. Section 58 on page 179 is um, technical assistance grants um, for small communities applying for federal assistance. Page, uh, section 59 on page 181 is a legislative report on automated safety enforcement. Section 60 on page 181 is um, tr expansion planning for the Metropolitan Council related to the Midtown Greenway um, trail being expanded from Minneapolis into St. Paul. Section 61 on page 183 is retroactive driver's license reinstatement. This is a provision that was heard by the Transportation Committee um, related to um, certain small level offenses now being eligible for and, and then had their driver's license suspended as a result of that. Those people are now eligible for reinstatement. Section 62 on page 184, line 9, is another study group that deals with um, the disposition of speed offenses and uh, studies whether those rates of citations have gone down or up over the last um, five or six years. I forget the exact range for the study. Uh, on page 63 on line, uh, on page 184, this is a study on the declining rates of vehicle registrations. Uh, the, the study must consult with the state patrol to see if whether enforcement is behind that or what, what are the other factors behind declining vehicle registration rates. Uh, section 64 is, let's see, section 64. I, don't, I think section 64 is just a reviser instruction, so not relevant. And section 65 is a repealer. Um, there are three paragraphs in the repealer on page 185. Um, they're all kind of interconnected to other sections. The first of which in paragraph A is related to the MnDOT um, operations center and the meteorog meteorological registration fee. Paragraph B is the repeal of weight limits for certain tow truck operators that's carried in a separate section. And paragraph C repeals the rules related to teleconference and online driver's education education for adults um, that's brought in as a part of the authorization for online and teleconference driver's education. That concludes all of Article 8's provisions. Thank you very much. I wonder if we want to have Commissioner Daubenberger want to speak to the committee for about two or three minutes, maybe, or Senator Dibble, you have other... Uh, Mr. Chair, I spoke with Commissioner Daubenberger um, beforehand, and um, she indicated that she was here for to questions. serve as witness and respond to questions. Thank you for yeah. being here. Um, we questions from the committee. We have Senator Dibble. You said you had ten amendments or ten that you're aware of, and eight and I think additional. We've done two yeah. of them. Do you want to? Correct. Yeah, we've dealt with two. Um, I'm, I'm available to whatever the chair desires, uh, responding okay. to amendments or responding to questions. Um, why don't we? Is there questions right now before we get to amendments? If not, Senator Muhammad, you had your oh, Senator um, Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Dibble, um, just before we get into amendments, uh, I was spent my weekend at the Officer Owen funeral out in Glenwood, um, getting some uh, inquiries from, from constituents already. It was a very somber, uh, uh, well-attended uh, event, uh, as you probably have seen. But uh, there's some questions they're asking and, and interest uh, in the new uh, overpass that uh, you you were part of in committee uh, over the railroad tracks and uh, the intersection on the north side of Glenwood and uh, some talk about looking at naming that bridge uh, pathway uh, in, in memo mor memorial for Josh Owens. And so, Senator Dibble, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I just wanted to bring it up um, 
I don't have language ready. I wanted to talk to a few more people, but I just wanted to kind of put it on the radar. Um, if not here, maybe some discussion about that between here and the floor. Um, and I, I guess other thoughts or feedback. I know we've named other memorial, uh, either highways or bridges, in, in memory of uh, fallen officers or others. Uh, uh, key yeah, figures, one. and so just just want to put it on your radar screen and you get any brief brief reaction. Great for for now. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom. That would be um, a great honor um, to do that. Um, we can do that either in this bill. Um, there, despite my efforts to the contrary, there is going to be at some point an omnibus policy bill in the not too distant future. So we could also do it there. Senator Muhammad. Um, Mr. Chair, if we're doing amendments, I have the A63 amendment. A, A63, A6, I believe. A63 okay. amendment. I think it's the compromise language for every for all the stakeholders for the blue line. It's A63 amendment is being distributed. And this is on Blue Line Rail Extension Engagement Meetings. On the, on the amendment, Senator Muhammad. Maybe we can have council go through it, but this is the, um, the blue line that will go, I think, parts of it through North Minneapolis and then um, suburbs as well. Um, and I think it's a compromise language between um, Hennepin County, City of Minneapolis, um, and a number of other folks who um, were involved. And I think it includes a lot of community engagement for folks on the north side who've had some issues with it and were afraid of displacement. So uh, community engagement, blue line. Senator Dibble. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think this is a, a good amendment. Um, gets to the heart of a, a lot of the anxiety that uh, occurs in the planning phase of these major transit projects. Maybe if we had something more robust and, I don't know, some other random LRT planning process, we wouldn't be having some of the kinds of conversations we have right now. Is there a discussion from members of the committee on the A63? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Muhammad, I, I don't have any real concerns with this amendment. I think it's a, a good idea. Uh, my skepticism is how effective will it be? I recall that a few years ago, Senator Dibble, you and I sat in the Metropolitan Governments Committee and asked for a very similar meeting with the Calhoun Towers uh, residents about something very similar about how the construction would impact their neighborhood, their their building and roughly despite the engagement meetings uh, the concerns fell on deaf ears and I'm concerned that this amendment really doesn't have the teeth to compel the Met Council to do anything different and I think that's been the, the concern all along as we talk about these light rail projects in that it, we should even be looking at a you know what the role of the Met Council should be overall in these projects. But I, Senator Muhammad, I think it's a good amendment. I just, I think at the end of the day, it's not going to be very effective. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Muhammad. Thank you, uh, Senator Pratt. Um, you know, I wasn't around um, at the time you guys were having those conversations, um, but I think uh, over the past few weeks, I've heard a um, number of conversations around this issue. I know uh, Chair Dibble has. I think this includes uh, clear language that um, essentially says business um, folks who are from the business community, residents who are afraid of displacement, um, the county, the city, everybody has to be at the table and have to come up with a framework and community feedback is essential to, to this project. And so. Um, I think we need to do what we can do to move forward to ensure that this happens and we can't be stuck in the past. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, uh, Chair Marty. And uh, you, my question has to do with uh, 
I guess lines 1.32 and 1. Point, or excuse me, and then 2.1 on the back side. Um, the possible redesign of Interstate 94. I, I guess I'd just like a little more clarification of 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 that portion of it. If the author could expand on that. Senator Dibble, Senator Muhammad, anybody uh, on that? Senator Muhammad, I guess. Okay. That's her amendment. Um, maybe I'll phone a friend for help. Um, I know Senator Champion knows too well about this project and issue if he wants to help me out. So Senator I'm sorry Champion. that I came in, Mr. Chair, uh, from talking to some constituents. So Senator uh, uh, Dreheim, you asked about what, what section of the... Uh, of I'm on the E63 amendment, uh, Chair, if that's okay. And Go then ahead. I'm on uh, line, it starts on line 1.32. Um, it, and it just talks about the possible redesign of Interstate 94, and I just wanted a little more um, explanation of, of what that is and what the intent of that is. Uh, Mr. Chair? Senator Chairman. So that area, when, when they think about the, the route, so there's this, there's this consideration for the route to go down uh, Broadway? and all the way across 94 to Washington. Uh, and then once you get to Washington, make a right and then go down. That's one idea that there was another idea where it would still be on Broadway and then come to Lindale uh, and, and then make a uh, turn there. And that, that, that one goes right into the heart of um, a section of the African-American community that was always billed as you know, uh, uh, um, suburbs in the city. So you have a very stable neighborhood. So there's some, some, some discussion about it where there's some uh, challenges around some of the information that was put forward before in order to even consider that as one of the route alignments. So they want to make sure that there's this robust discussion and fill in the blanks of things that were missing before and to really uh, make sure that the information and the paces that the, that the um, authorities are going through make sense. And so this also allows for, the, for transportation in the city of Minneapolis and others to join Met Council and Hennepin County to really consider this because uh, there's been some concern about just Met Council making decisions, uh, especially with some of their, uh, with their track record that people are a little concerned about. So that's why that is. And so it is to make sure that there's this open and honest discussion about this corridor and there has to be an opportunity for others to really present their concerns and ideas and for them to be uh, listened to and respected and considered and for folks to trust the process. So that's what it's about. Senator Jahan. Thank you, uh, Senator Champion. Um, you know, I, I guess my concern is that it, it's a very busy interstate, and, and I would hate to reduce the capacity of, of the interstate um, for the blue line. And, um, you know, traditionally, light rail uh, doesn't move as many people as the interstate does, or, or the commerce, or our fire trucks, school buses, et cetera. Um, Mr. Chair, Senator, so that Senator uh, uh, Dreheim has a clarity. This does not go on to I-94, so it does not affect I-94 that way, just so that you're clear. Further it, dis it doesn't have anything to do with the interstate. When we think in terms of going on 94, it, is a, it, it goes over 94. Thank you. Further discussion on the A-63? Senator Westrom. Mr. Uh, Chair, um, maybe uh, Senator Mohammed, the blue line is where and what is the, I was thinking the blue line is the one that's got all the problems going to Eden Prairie, but what's the name of that one if that's not the blue line? And can you explain a little more about the blue line? Senator Dibble. Um, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll, Senator Mohammed is confabbing in the back there, so I'll just take it real quick. Uh, so the, uh, the green line is, is the... Um, is also known as the Southwest LRT, or the Green Line Extension is also known as the Southwest LRT, the one that we talk about a lot around here. The Blue Line um, is, and so the first part of the Green Line, of course, goes from downtown Minneapolis to downtown St. Paul. The Blue Line is the line that goes from downtown Minneapolis 
to the airport and then to the Mall of America. This would be the Blue Line extension then would, then would go up through North Minneapolis and up to the nearby northwestern suburbs, kind of on a diagonal. And Mr. Chair, if I Sir, could add that, that it also, the Blue Line touches like Minneapolis, Robbinsdale, Crystal, and Brooklyn Park. And so it'd be just important to know that it does not uh, uh, touch the areas of, 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 of what you were talking about there, Senator Western. Further discussion on the A63. If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion prevails. We have seven more amendments left, so I want to first announce that we are not going to get to the cannabis bill today. We'll have to take that up tomorrow. And we, we do want to finish this bill today, and if we cannot finish it, which I'm now beginning looking more clear, by 11 o'clock when we have to adjourn, we will have to take it up, I hope, come back later, depending on the timing today, but we'll be up in the air. Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have the A67 amendment. A67 amendment. It's not in the packet, so. Um, it, can you describe what it's about as, as being distributed? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and Senator Herr is here. This is, I'm offering this on his behalf. And in the bill, there is the establishment of a new deputy registrar in Hennepin County. And uh, Senator Herr would like to also establish one in Ramsey County in St. Paul on the east side. And this language, and I believe we have an oral amendment, would um, take care of that. And I believe he's had a discussion with uh, Senator Dibble about it. Senator, who has the oral amendment? Senator Dibble? Or Senator? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Greenfield can help us with the Mr. oral. Mr. Greenfield. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members and Senator Pappas. Um, the oral amendment I was envisioning, um, based on what Senator Herr requested, is on page 1, line 11. After the word at, we are going to be inserting or in the proximity of uh, I believe Senator Herr expressed concern that if the deputy registrar that is to be appointed cannot get space at the shopping center, that they would be operating across the street. So we want to just at least capture as much of that area as possible to allow for that possibility that they might not be able to operate specifically within the shopping center. Sure. So I, I can restate the instruction if that would make the most sense. So on page 1, line 11, after at, insert, or in the proximity of. Senator Pappas incorporates that? I'll incorporate that, Mr. Chairman. Is there a discussion of the amendment? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Other amendments? Senator Dibble, you had a number. I don't know if you have a preference for what order we take them up. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, why don't we um, do the A57? A57 amendment. It's and being distributed as well. Ms. Boyd can uh, help explain it. Uh, it's posted already, I believe. But yes, okay. And it has to do with um, utilizing some of the uh, authorization or appropriation um, for commercial vehicle What's it? enforcement, mm -hmm. federal match dollars out of the Trunk Highway Fund. Uh, we would make in the first biennium um, some of those resources available to purchase a new airplane uh, for the state patrol. They would sell or otherwise get rid of their existing two airplanes, which I think are circa 1981, are ready to fall out of the sky and buy a new airplane. 1981? Yes. Um, Senator Friends offers the A57 amendment for... New airplane for state patrol. Is there a discussion on that amendment? Not. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Senator Dibble, how about uh, A56? Um, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, the A56. I'm just going by amendment go. numbers here. And uh, while it's coming around, Mr. Chair, or people are glancing at it, um, this would lower the threshold or the amount that Greater Minnesota uh, transit uh, entities um, would have to match uh, for state dollars, um, at least for some period of time. Maybe Ms. Boyd can, uh, yeah, Ms. Boyd can help us explain it, just to make it easier for them to receive and use money that we're 
making available to greater You're Minnesota. getting harder to hear. So yeah. you're, you're saying we lower the threshold that they the need local, for matching? Yeah, reduce or? the local match for Greater Minnesota Transit okay. for a limited period of time. Senator Friends moves the A56 amendment. Is there any discussion of it? Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Dibble. Um, thanks for recognizing some of the challenges we have in Greater Minnesota for transit. Lowering the match seems like a positive step forward. And on behalf of those from Greater Minnesota, appreciate it very much. I'm a yes on this amendment, Mr. Chair. Any discussion on the A56 amendment? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Let's take up a, my next chart says an A59 amendment. This is the Marty amendment. Oh, the, that we've the seen, grant management. We've seen, Sir, I believe, a number of times. We've done this on all the other bills as well. Um, Senator Murphy, you want to offer the A59, the Finance Review of Grant and Business Subsidy Recipients? Thanks, Mr. Chair. That is my amendment. I move the A59. And I'm not sure everybody has it yet, but this is the same language we've had in the other bills. That's right, Mr. Chair. This is the amendment that we're moving um, through this committee. It deals with both profit and nonprofit uh, grant review and grant making. Is there, does everybody have the amendment? Yeah. Is there any discussion of the A59 amendment? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Senator Dibble, the next number I have is A62. Mr. Chair, um, yes, if someone could move the A62, um, uh, just to, it describes a certain type of township of which there is only one, which is White Bear Township, um, which um, is effectively uh, a large city. It has a population of about 11,000 people. It's, a, it's an odd creature. It's a township in the metro area that's uh, non-contiguous, it's in three parts. Anyways, they, the short version is they have a very hard time accessing um, the kind of support that other local units of government enjoy uh, to support their local roads, and they are deeply in the red in their effort to um, maintain and keep up the roads. So this is just kind of a first take one time on the, some of the newly created funds that we create uh, for townships. Senator Muhammad moves the A62 amendment. And Senator Dibble, you, uh, is this the first time we're putting in a regular funding source for the cities under 5,000? Um, no. Um, well, yes, this is the first time we're creating a sustained ongoing source of funds for cities under 5,000 as well as cities above 5,000. This, however, is coming from a right. township no, I understand source. This yeah. is different. I'm just saying I yeah. think some of these smaller communities have been shortchanged in the past. Um, on Senator... Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Dibble, uh, if I understand it right, this is the only one that fits in this category. Uh, do we do we have a crack in the barn door or Katie bar the door or the next township that's got 11,100 and then the 10,900 will come in and have the same request or any any concerns about that? No, uh, Mr. Chair, that's a great question. I'm really glad you asked it, Senator Westrom. No, um, White Bear Township is larger than any other township by many factors. So I, I don't know what the next highest population township is, but it doesn't come close to 11,000 people. Further discussion on the Muhammad Amendment A62? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion prevails. A64 amendment. I'm just going through the numbers in the order you have them. Thank you. Senator Dibble. Mr. Chair, the rail safety language, this is uh, related to the Rob Kupek bill um, that has to do with a, a number of uh, improvements to um, rail safety planning and communication and um, uh, uh, coordination. Um, and so this has a couple of elements. One uh, that was um, agreed to by the railroads and the Department of Public Safety, and it has to do with the tabletop exercises being done upon request. And what is the other piece? Uh, okay, is there, um, Senator Wickland offers the A64 amendment. Uh, is there a discussion of the rail safety amendment? Um, if not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. 
I see one more in this pile. That doesn't mean that that's all there are, but A65. So, Mr. Chair, the A65 would um, allow allows for a couple of additional uses of the sales tax in the metro area that is created in the bill. Um, so, we have this idea um, that MnDOT is probably the better entity agency to build large-scale uh, construction projects uh, uh, for metro transit in light of some of the concerns that have been brought to light by Southwest LRTs and MnDOT just does a far better job. Anyways, so that uh, resulted in a $9 million fiscal note and a staffing complement of 200 and some people. It was kind of breathtaking. Um, <laughs> So we, well, at some point we're going to revisit those assumptions, but in any case, um, uh, rather than absorb that in the general fund target, we would simply say that the sales tax in the metro area would be used for that purpose. And then also um, an eligible purpose would be to uh, allow for cost of living adjustments for, uh, eight, uh, for uh, metro transit operators, so bus drivers and, and the like. There, um, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Dibble. I missed, I missed some of the conversation. So, if this has already been touched on, my apologies. But um, does is this to suggest that light rail and but BRT will will be managed by MnDOT versus Matt Council? Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt. Excellent question. Short answer is no. Um, they would only be constructed by MnDOT. Similar, the blue line actually was, was constructed in this fashion, was constructed by MnDOT, and then, of course, the Metro, Metro Transit is the owner and operator, so it'd be following that model. Senator Pratt. Thank you, and, and forgive me for not knowing the answer, Senator Dibble, and this is different than the structure under the Southwest Light Rail? Senator Dibble. Mr. Chair, absolutely correct, yeah. So the Southwest Light Rail has is, been is constructed by Metro Transit. Um, and Senator Pappas, we're going to move to A65. Mr. Chairman, I would be happy to do that. Uh, on the A65 amendments, um, any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion prevails. Other amendments? I think that's the last one I've seen from the list you gave me. Senator Pappas. M uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't have an amendment. I do have a question for Senator Dibble. Um, Senator Dibble, I see in the bill that there is a provision for um, freight operations that they have to have two workers on the train. But has there been any discussion in committee about train lengths um, and any concern about that? I just read an article recently about how train lengths are getting longer and longer and might be contributing to train accidents, although it's not. I don't know if the data is really clear on that. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Pappas, not in and of itself. The discussion about two-person train crews is related to train lengths. Um, you know, the idea that we would have mile and two mile long trains with only one person stretches credulity in, right. in terms of the conversation around safety, particularly if certain activities need to occur in the event of a derailment or, mm -hmm. or even in the event of a you know, a lesser incident, like a impact with a, another vehicle. Um, but no, not in and of itself. So um, I would love to see that article. I, I will forward that to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I ask if there are any more amendments from members of the committee? And I don't want to cut short debate on this, but I want to ask members if we, if we can finish in the next few minutes, we can finish now, otherwise we'll come back. But Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, no amendment. Just a little more clarification on the one amendment we just adopted, Senator Dibble, uh, with the White Bear Township. Uh, is this the first time we've made this exception or change to uh, highway funding uh, with with the township as opposed to an unincorporated? Why why did we have to do it for White Bear Township? Is it because they haven't incorporated as a city, and so they they don't fall under the city's over five thousand category, or or what? What was the purpose, and is this the first time we've done that? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Westrom, uh, the answer to your, both your questions is yes. White Bear Township um, is, is not um, a municipality, it's a township. 
um, they want to remain a township for their for their own reasons, which I respect. Um, you know, people support the township style of government, the direct form of government. They want to maintain that. That's been their history and their tradition. Um, and yes, this is the first time we've done an exception uh, for this purpose. Um, you know, and designated some funds. White Bear Township has, you know, because it's so much larger. I mean, it, you know, it fun it's functions in a, in a lot of ways like a, you know, a small city or a medium-sized city um, in terms of the, you know, mileage and the and the uh, uh, degradation of their roads. Um, and the, and they're just really um, stretched very very thin. And um, you know, they don't qualify for local government aid. Um, uh, you know, fiscal disparities, any of the other kinds of AIDS programs um, that might help offset the kind of pressure they have in maintaining and keeping up with their residential road system. So uh, we're looking for a way to help with that. When given the fact that additional resources are flowing into um, townships from a variety of sources, um, it seemed like this would be an opportunity, at least on a one-time basis, to offset the kind of pressure that they're feeling. Um, members, we're, we're going to have to recess. Um, I think there, I talked with Senator Pratt, it sounds like we'll want to have some discussion of the bill, um, which will take some time, and we'll try and do that depending on how late session goes today. Uh, if there are no more amendments, though, be, if you don't mind, before we move forward, um, I'm going to ask if Senator Murphy would move that the title and contents of House File 2887, the House File, be stricken and replaced with the title and contents of Senate File 3157, the bill we've been working on as amended. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As, as, as I mentioned, I think there's still some more debate that has to be made. I don't know if there'll be other amendments. I think we've had some good discussion today. If we do, we can amend them to that language. We'll just make sure if anybody, if nobody has amendments now, if anybody comes up with some, we'll amend them to House File 2887. Okay. If, if, Mr. So Chair, this, if you'll permit me just a little bit of process, sure. I think it might be wise to put Senate File 3157 on the table and then pick up the House that File. Would and make that would be helpful. Motion. Senator Murphy moves the House File, that Senate File 3157 as amended be laid on the table. So moved. On that, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevailed. Now Senator Murphy moves that the title and contents of House File 2887, the House language, be stricken and replaced with the title and contents of Senate File 3157 as amended. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. So there, if there are more amendments, members, they should be drafted to the same language but with that title. Um, is there, if n no further discussion, what we're going to do is recess to the call of the chair, which I expect to be uh, a few minutes after session, depending on how long session goes. I will consult with members, Senator Pratt and DFL members and others on the floor. So if anybody has strong feelings about how long we're going today, um, let me know. But I think we just need discussion. It may be a half hour, hour, I don't know. But we will recess to that point. With that, thank you, members. and. Thanks, Ms. Mr. Greenfield and Ms. Boyd. Thanks for all your help as well. With that, the meeting is in recess. Yeah, I, I'm assuming.